Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, I'm here just to present the keynote speaker, but first let me say, and especially to congratulate, to congratulate my colleague, Filomena Gonçalves, for the work she has done in running a team. I know how hard it is, so first of all, let me congratulate her. Well, uh, in, during 2006 and 2009, I, I, I managed a program, uh, uh, a project, a European project that I still remember very well called Medin's Identity is the Future. When I finished the program, the project, I asked to myself, who wrote the convention? I know to meet him. Well, <laughs> he's one of the guys that uh, wrote the convention. Professor Mark Jacobs, that I know since my curiosity in those years, I, I think we know each other in the meeting of UNESCO, something like that in Paris some years ago. Some know, a lot of years ago. <laughs> and uh, Professor Mark Jacobs is not only his full-time professor of University of Antwerpia, mm -hmm. and also he spends some time with the uh, Free University of Brussels, where he, ha he, he manages chair, UNESCO chair in, in critical heritage is the name. And because he had now, as he, he just told me a couple of minutes ago, uh, 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 he the, the, the chair is about the, uh, the critical heritage. So he organized a department of critical heritage, conservation and restoration, as far as I remember, he's the head of the department. And so he's perhaps he, want, he, run, he has run the project Faro that he leaves now. And uh, special important, I think it is special important uh, the fact that during uh, uh, the, the, those years of 2001, 2002, somebody has to wrote the convention because it doesn't appear like this. And he, because he was member of the Belgian committee, he was uh, because it is interesting. He, he has this uh, one of these days. He should testify how he, the political uh, issues meet the uh, technical things, and to manage all this, to have organized this dialogue should be hard. But he was perhaps in the world one of the persons that can only. Uh, can uh, uh, provide some information, not only about this, but especially the important things that, uh, that uh, we are talking about in, in about intangible heritage. So for me, it's not only a pleasure to meet a friend, but also the enormous pleasure to meet us that somebody that really know about the subject. Mark, the floor is yours. And I go there to listen better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Barata. Thank you for the organizers. For, thank you for uh, inviting me. So I have the task to uh, try to condense my speech of 45 minutes in 20 or 25 minutes. So I will do my best. Okay. So uh, UNESCO. Uh, sometimes you can fit it in a box. Uh, UNESCO arena, it fits in a flight case waiting to be unpacked. And you see these little trolleys, if you really notice them, they go to the corridors of UNESCO headquarters and they are unpacked in meeting rooms or they put it on a plane, they fly it somewhere to a congress venue or a luxury hotel and they unpack it. And if it's unpacked, you see this, it's filled with those black uh, 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 plates with uh, white letters on it, and in principle, this big box contains at least 194 nameplates of each member state of UNESCO, in English and in French, and they are organized in alphabetical order in, in the room. So, for instance, here, the lady from Ethiopia, she just spoke, so her uh, sign is upside down. So we have every country has uh, a nameplate like this, but also the secretariat, uh, so the people working in UNESCO themselves, and sometimes they have special names. It's either Secretariat, you see Formico uh, over there, and you see the Secretary of the Convention until uh, 
two weeks ago, it was Tim Curtis, and uh, for instance, the, uh, uh, the Assistant Director General for Culture is not there, but you see ADG Cult, and uh, special <laughs> plates, for instance, the ICH and the O Forum are made for the uh, 2003 convention. We also have NGOs, for instance, and sometimes, but they're all in that black box. Uh, sometimes they make special plates, like for instance here, you see a number of NGOs, and they make not the black thing, but a bit white, they try to make it uh, themselves. So uh, what you see here is for instance, how these plaques are used. You put it in front of your desk, and uh, then you wait until you can speak. And if you want to take the floor, or if you're speaking, you put your sign uh, up like uh, this. So, uh, mutatis mutandis, so things are, you use the plaques everywhere, but things change. And for instance, the person sitting behind these uh, nameplates, they change. And we give the example of Belgium. So, uh, in Belgium, we have one plate for the country, but it's a federal state, and every region is competent, fully competent to develop a policy. So the green over there, that's Flanders. The blue is the Walloon part. The yellow part is the German-speaking part. And the uh, part in the middle is Brussels. And so four entities, four different policies, four different ministers, and they all send representatives. A civil servant, an expert, a diplomat, so they all have diplomats, etc. So the Belgian team, that's why we also occupy the place of Benin, Bhutan, and Bolivia, uh, because they were not there, but we have such a big delegate. So it really, the, so you have this meeting traveling all over the world with those nameplates, but who is behind the plate, it changes per country, and the composition really makes a difference. If it's a diplomat who's there, if it's an expert, if they're both and they have to agree on something. And like, for instance, in Belgium, if you want to take the floor with those 10 persons, we have to have consensus on what uh, will be said. Or sometimes they say, okay, you can speak on this topic and, and go for it. And luckily, that's the case. Otherwise, we would never say anything. Okay. So you have the countries, you have the uh, people in the secretariat, and you also have observers. And the people who uh, know a bit about UNESCO will think this uh, sign is very strange. I will explain it in. So this kind of setting with this flight case with nameplates, it happens in a lot of conventions. And there's a very good book uh, published in uh, years ago, two or three years ago by Christoph Blumann, The Best We Share, Nation, Culture, and World Heritage Making in the UNESCO World Heritage Arena. I like the metaphor of arena, so you see again this setting. And uh, in the book he describes, uh, it's like he goes there as an anthropologist and he tries to understand what is going on. He also describes an important phase of the World Heritage Convention, so the 1972 convention, not the 2003 convention, how this works. And, and they discuss the whole mechanism of uh, that you have to raise your plate and then you get uh, the floor the people try to manage this uh, system. So, and as Bruman explains in his uh, book, uh, normally people do not use names. So I think a lot of the people in, I've been going to these meetings of intangible heritage for more than 20 years. So a lot of the people in the room know that I'm Mark, but I never addressed as Mark, I'm also Belgian. So, and it's Belgian and it's, Portugal, etc., and you only use those. No names are uh, mentioned. Okay. So, uh, when you're a researcher, uh, where would you normally sit? So, uh, and I give this example of a meeting of the General Assembly of the 2003 Convention in Paris, the 1st of June 2022. So, and you would say, where would the researcher be in the arena? And I think most researchers would definitely say, in the back behind the observer plate. So it or outside looking at the video or reading the text. So the observer is here or there or there. But could the observer also be here? And the or, or the no, the researcher, could he be here? Or could it be here? Can you 
recognize me, so I'm sitting there. Okay. I will come back to this question later or in any discussion. According to me, it's possible to be in that place, in the arena itself, with access to the microphone and write about it. But this is not, not everyone agrees on this. Because it is often said, you know too much. I think as a researcher, you know too much. That's okay, think about that. Okay, observers, uh, this is a photograph I got from my friend Jorin Nering, and she managed to capture this. This is Cécile Duvel, she was the third secretary of the convention, so she was the boss of the convention in front, of, on the podium, uh, managing the whole setting, but she had to retire, and then uh, she had to change positions, and she had to go to the observer thing, and. Uh, look at what happened. And what I particularly like on, on the photograph is in the background, you see uh, Noriko Aikawa. She was the first secretary of the <coughs> UNESCO convention, and also the person who more or less made the convention and managed the convention since the 1990s. So, mutatis mutatis, you can, uh, so these Positions are all there, but who is behind it, it can change, and you have to adapt to this uh, situation. <coughs> okay. So now I, I have to say something about uh, boundary objects. So we have already known this flight case, this kind of black box, and, and the blue book, you probably know the basic text of the 2003 convention, and we'll try to explain what a boundary object is. And uh, for instance, uh, this concept which was launched by Susan D. Starr and, and James Grissomer in a study about how to create a museum on uh, zoology in the beginning of the 20th century. And they said we have a number of elements or instruments that are uh, plastic or flexible enough to adapt to local needs and constraints of the several parties employing them, but robust enough to maintain a common identity across sites. And in their museum, they use, for instance, the map of California to demonstrate this. So I hear the map of uh, Portugal. For some, it's, it's for if you're doing a study on intangible heritage, you can use this map to map, make an inventory of all the elements on that territory. But you can also use the map to try to obtain funds. Go to the national government, we want to make this inventory to the program, and this map helps to uh, bring everyone together. Or if you go to Evora, they perhaps will also sponsor you. Or you can do an ecological study using that map as, as a reference. So this is the idea of, uh, of a boundary object. It can be a map, an inventory, etc. It helps to uh, facilitate communication. And uh, for instance, nameplates can also uh, uh, express this different way of, of organizing. And I had a video here about the Netherlands who had a whole discussion about their nameplate. They changed it from Peiba to uh, the kingdom of the Netherlands to include a number of countries like, uh, or countries like Aruba, Curaçao and St. Martin. And it was the ambassador who made that statement three weeks ago, I will speak for four countries instead of one. It uh, can be discussed. Here, my cell phone. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So, and also, the. Oh, probably stop. Okay. So, uh, and in Belgium, uh, how does this state, uh, member state uh, instrument work? So, there's an article uh, making this convention of 2003 applicable also to federal states. And this is a good example of how uh, these boundary objects work, like inventories that are organized at the level of a state party. It looks very obvious, but you have to understand that every word in that convention, it can be applied to different situations, mutatis mutandis. So for this, in Belgium, we don't have one inventory, but four separate from each other, and uh, they're all part recognized as satisfying Article 12 to ensure identification with the view to safeguard each state party, for instance Belgium, self-draw up in a manner geared to its own situation 
one or more inventories of the intangible culture heritage present in its territory. These inventories shall be regularly updated. This last sentence is quite important because this structures the way in the whole world, in all these boundary objects that are countries, of how to do safeguarding. And there will be, uh, I think, uh, a presentation from the Netherlands explaining the importance of this updating mechanism. And this is, I could go on for hours uh, about it, but this is how this blue book, which is a big collection of these boundary objects, all kinds of words that can be interpreted and influence policy worldwide. It's constructed as what Bruno Latour said, a black box, something that can exercise power. Okay, how was this blue book made, the basic text, and how was the convention uh, made? So it was on up to part a reaction to the 1972 convention, and especially to the World Heritage List. And what happened is well explained by Christoph Brumann, who said, especially in the 1990s, there was a lot of criticism against the convention, too Eurocentric, half of the items were, uh, can be found in Italy, for instance, or in, or in Europe. So there should be uh, um, a change, and this is what the world asked for. And in the World Heritage, he calls it the 1990s, the heroic age, where a new global strategy was developed, uh, a new heritage category like cultural landscapes, new standards of authenticity. And he also mentioned uh, by the year 2000, more and more uh, states ratified the 1972 convention, so things started changing. But there still was, this is the map of uh, World Heritage Sites in the year 2000, and you clearly see the problem, uh, according to people who do not live in Europe, that there is uh, a kind of imbalance. If you look at how many uh, inscriptions there are, the blue line on top is Europe, and the, for instance, the yellow line is Africa. So there is a problem. And that was clear in, at the end of the uh, 20th century. Another thing that was clear, part of the reaction was uh, that there was a recommendation on the safeguarding of traditional culture and folklore. There was a big conference in 1999, and they said, well, one of the problems is that concept of traditional culture and folklore. It does, doesn't work. There are not enough stakeholders included in uh, the way it's done. We should not have a recommendation, but a convention, and the focus should be on local empowerment and international uh, cooperation. And I distinguish three phases in the history of the country. <coughs> First, starting in 2001 to 2003, when a number of intergovernmental experts using that nameplate system uh, discussed about how to make uh, a convention text. It was were predominantly experts meeting there with a few diplomats uh, helping. And uh, it was building on consensus. It is a masterpiece of compromise, the 2003 con convention. And in that phase, there are a number of people, uh, I could put uh, dozens of photos here, but I've put the photo of Norika Aikawa here. She was really the, the person behind everything since the 1990s. Uh, Mohamed uh, Bejawi, who was uh, a minister from Algeria. He was the chairperson trying to lead this whole process. You also see Sherif Kaznadar, for instance, for, from France. And together they formed what is called in scientific literature an epistemic community, a group or network of experts, specialists, anthropologists, lawyers, uh, historians, etc., working together on a policy issue, thinking they are uh, saving the world by, by doing this and writing this text. And this epistemic community, it's, uh, I'm probably part of, of that community. It worked well, especially in the first 10 years of the convention. Now, uh, in 2023, if I look in the rooms of UNESCO meetings, I don't see a lot of colleagues that were there uh, so many years ago. And uh, so things are changing. Mutatis, mutatis. 
Okay, what was the exercise that was being done? It was, on the one hand, creating a system that is definitely not world heritage, so all these taboo words have to be invited, uh, avoided. World heritage, authenticity, unique, universal value, outstanding, treasure, masterpiece, exceptional, exclusive, superior. That comes always to a shock to people. You cannot use these words when working with the uh, Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Culture Heritage. And there was also an attempt to get rid of classical mid-20th century folklore studies, so don't use concepts like folk, folk life, the people, ethnic, minorities, essentialism, character. The basic rule is that you have to stick to the vocabulary in that blue book and try to use that. <coughs> also in those first years, problems of commercialization, uh, exploitation in economy, tourism, etc. They were all discussed, but said, well, it's too difficult. We'll talk about that later. And later is 20 years later after uh, issuing the convention. So, now. Okay. So, there was also this masterpieces program <coughs> of the oral and intangible heritage of humanities. 90 things were inscribed. The most important is the effect on the map. So, Global South uh, is uh, predominant. In the discussions in those meetings, uh, something had to be found that is definitely not World Heritage, not these masterpieces program, but uh, trying to find a compromise. And that's how these three instruments were developed. Article 16, the representative list, uh, not World Heritage, but according to some, World Heritage Light or World Heritage Zero, like Coca-Cola Zero. So uh, it looks like Coca-Cola, but it does not have sugar or caffeine. And that's Article 16, so for some. Article 17, about intangible heritage in need of urgent safeguarding, and Article 18, about good practices. Okay, what were the purpose of the convention? You probably all know that, so I will skip that to safeguard intangible heritage and to provide for international cooperation. I... Uh, Focus on Article 15, my favorite article, participation of communities, groups, and individuals. That's the real importance of that convention, to have this participatory method, and it has influence in the heritage paradigm uh, all over the world. If you look back at the convention, you see that the epistemic community put a lot of emphasis on uh, capacities and competencies to do safeguarding programs. And you see them in a number of uh, rules and Article 6.7 state that state members of the committee, so the countries, shall choose as their representatives persons who are qualified in the various fields of the intangible culture heritage. So those people behind the nameplates, they should be specialists in intangible heritage. The first years, first 10 years, it was more or less the case with a lot of diplomats and lawyers. Today, these experts and people qualified are in the minority. So it are the ambassadors who, talk, who speak, and it are rare exceptions where actually Article 6.7 is applied. And that's a pity. Okay, so focus on uh, capacity building, etc. It's, it's an important line in UNESCO. There were a number of organs of the convention, the General Assembly and the Intergovernmental Committee, and this uh, Intergovernmental Committee, they could approve the operation directives. I see I, the time is running fast. Okay, so between 2006 and 2016, this is the period of the nameplate actors. So the, the different member states and the people in the secretariat playing this game of interpreting the convention, trying to stay with the vocabulary of the blue book, more or less following the rules that were established. And uh, it was checked by the principle of consensus. So in this meeting room, if you try to discuss something and two or three persons do not agree, then the system of consensus building is you really have to listen to what they say and try to convince them. And it's only at the last resort that you say, let's have a vote, because a voting is considered as an extreme aggressive move. So that is avoided, or that was avoided. 
And this allowed for uh, more or less following the rules. So the rules are the operation directives. The first, they were made between 2006 and 2008. And they are updated every two years. And you can find the uh, operation directives in the blue book. OK. What most people are interested in is the representative list. Nobody knows what the word representative means. That was the intention, to keep it vague, uh, so we could make a compromise. And in, uh, to reach that uh, first set of operation directives, especially operation directive number two, there were five criteria that uh, had to be met to be inscribed on the representative list. And they are extremely easy. It has to be intangible heritage. It has to contribute to visibility and awareness. So it's, it's a paraphrase of Article 16. You have to have some safeguarding measures. You have to involve communities, groups, and individuals. And it has to be included in an inventory as defined in Articles 11 and 12 of the Convention. How easy can it be? But to apply this, there was a, uh, an agreement made in New Delhi. It's nowhere on paper, but there were a number of people who were behind those nameplates who negotiated among each other. Let's go for these five uh, easy criteria, but apply the rules in a very strict way so we can refuse more than half of the nomination files. If a comma is in the wrong place or a, a taboo word is used, let's stop the file. And this worked, and why was this? To keep the inflation effect of too many nominations under, uh, under control. Because they, the specialists did not want a sunset clause. After 10 years, you get off the list, or after 20 years, they did not want that. So, <coughs> and this took much energy of the of the committee to apply these rules and to apply the hidden rule of the New Delhi Compromise in 2008. Personally, I, I also tried to see if there were implicit rules, like the no electricity rules, uh, acoustic guitars, yes, electric guitars, no, in, if you nominate something, or not European court culture, so no Shakespeare, no classical music, no thing, so all kind of popular culture in Europe or all kinds of culture outside Europe. So I wrote an article about this, but uh, and now this, uh, perhaps luckily, this, uh, these two criteria are uh, implicit criteria do not seem to function anymore, which is not bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, the blue book, it works as this boundary objects and uh, it, they are available in several languages, in Arabic, in Chinese, in Russian, in English, in French. And if you look at the different uh, wordings, these words are not exactly the same. So mutatis, mutandis, they change, etc. And like for instance, I gave you the example in Flanders, we originally translated safeguarding as beschermen, which is literally translated protection. In 2010, our minister said, well, protection is the wrong word. We should invent something. So a new word was invented, borgen, to say, well, safeguarding is something else than protecting is something of the 21st century. And basically, the section in tangible heritage did a similar thing. They changed their name into the entity of living heritage to express it. Okay. So these criteria, they are interpreted in several ways, but I will skip this. Uh, another important thing that happened between 2006 and 2010, especially around 2015, is that uh, the idea grew that this convention should contribute to something in the world, and especially to a number of major ethical principles like climate change or inequality in the world. So it was connected. Two things were invented, uh, ethical principles, 12 ethical principles, and the uh, sixth chapter of the operation directives was fine-tuned to the Agenda 2030 uh, of the United Nations, so the Sustainable Development Goals. And then two other things were uh, invented uh, later. So the ethical principles, uh, they're part of the blue book of the, 
of the basic text, but it's a very difficult instrument to use because there, it basically, you have to reshuffle the principles and then you discover that about half of them emphasize the relative autonomy of communities, groups and individuals. They decide what will happen if it's in danger, if something can be done. The six others are interventions from above, more cosmopolitan ideas about gender equality and, and other things. And if you put those two together, autonomy and these interventions, including the sustainable development group, you have this tension. And this tension is not resolved, but you can use this to cope with it. Okay. This instrument until now is, I think, probably too difficult and it it's hardly used, especially also because the UNESCO Secretariat does not want to open that box of Pandora, because then they have to deal with all kinds of political issues and confront these ethical principles, and they try to stay away. Another thing that happened was uh, the a new chapter in the operation directives, translating the sustainable development goals into operation directives. And what I particularly like about uh, this chapter is uh, Operation Directive 170 and 171D, because there the uh, role of culture brokers, of mediators, people like you, trying to explain to different groups what this convention is all about, what the Sustainable Development Goals is all about, and try to mediate. And I'm very happy that this uh, is there. Okay. And uh, I showed you this picture of the 1st of June uh, 2016. That was the moment where the operation directives had to be included in the blue book. It almost did not happen. It was a very close call. And uh, why is this? For several things. And why it happened, it is explained in this book that will be published in December by Chiara Bortolotto and Ahmed Skunti. Intangible Culture, Heritage, and Sustainable Development. And I hope uh, the editor, Routledge, will put the subtitle in there, because the subtitle is Inside the UNESCO Convention. And in that, I published an article where I describe from within, in that seat in front, trying to defend that sixth chapter against all kinds of people who wanted to delete it or, or remove it, and how this is done. And we can talk, if we have the time, the next two days, we can talk about it. Is it possible for a researcher like me, who was there as, a, as an actor, to uh, now take the scholarly role and describe and analyze what happened? I claim I can do that. Okay. Since 2016, it's, it's a new period, especially 2017, 2018, and uh, a number of things happened in the in the Intergovernmental Committee. And I've referred to it's also the period of Bolsonaro, of Trump, of Brexit, of Boris Johnson, alternative facts. So you, you analyze a file, but does it have to be true? Does it actually, if you claim that an inventory is there and, and it's not, but if you say, well, look better, it's there, although it's not, it's there, so we inscribe it. These kind of things started happening since 2016. So, uh, on the one hand, uh, this is a problem. On the other hand, there were also long-tail endeavors, including the sustainable development. And if you go back to the uh, book by Drumann, it describes a similar event happening in the World Heritage Convention, especially the meeting in Brasilia in 2010, before there was this game of consensus seeking and in Brasilia, uh, the diplomats took over and they basically accepted everything without uh, positive advice, etc. So they claimed, we are in power, we can vote by majority what the truth is or what world heritage is, so we'll include. And Bruman has fantastic pages describing this and analyzing uh, what happened. And he especially uh, said there was this principle of signature list where he can um, submit an amendment to say, well, this will happen. You ask half of the people in the room to co-sign it, to say amendments co-signed by 12 members, 
And then you say, well, we have the majority, we want this included. So no more consensus building, no more listening to arguments, etc. just forcing. Bruma said in, this happened in the World Heritage Convention, but they said this is going way too far. So there's now an operation directive prohibiting this kind of techniques. This is what happened in 2017, 2018, also in the Convention for Intangible Heritage. Okay. So how did they deal uh, with recommendations of the evaluation body when they were negative? Uh, they basically overruled. Okay, I don't have the time to uh, do this, but I would give as an example because it, it's, it's, for me it's a shift in, in this paradigm in many ways. It's a file by Jamaica of reggae music of Jamaica that was submitted for the representative list and the evaluation body that uh, looked at the file, it said, well, it satisfies Criterium R1, it is important for, uh, for people, and you can consider it as intangible heritage. R3, it's, uh, it's ensured through transmission, and there are good safeguarding measures so that reggae will keep alive, be alive. And R4, uh, a number of stakeholders were uh, consulted. What was not <coughs> satisfied was R2. And R2 is uh, that you have to uh, prove that adding an element on the representative list that it will add to visibility and awareness and dialogue. And that's one of the, that's where that New Delhi consensus is. What you cannot say is that putting something on the list will add visibility and awareness of your own element. But you have to say it's, it's not about us, we are totally unimportant, we, our carnival is not the most important, it's carnivals in general. And that's the answer you have to give. And a lot of people do not understand. They cannot just say, I will put it on the list, recognized by UNESCO, then we're world famous, and this will be the... If you say that, it's refused. So that's also what the people uh, in Jamaica did. And you can debate about this. It's... The other one is about uh, the inventory. And they actually used, if you look at the inventory, they used an inventory from 1977, which is basically a list of a number of records that were recorded in the 1970s and 1980s about reggae music featuring Bob Marley and others. But not really an inventory and not updated. And this was what the evaluation body uh, said. And this was not liked by uh, the meeting, uh, the people in the room, so they changed all the criteria. For instance, R5, uh, where they said, well, the the file does not have any proof that it's updated, that uh, communities are involved, there's no numbering, and then the meeting room uh, decides, well, the file indicates that its element was included in the automatic catalog, it's updated by monthly and reviewed annually. It's not, but okay, that's what, the, what they decide, that's the new truth that will be there. It's online, accessible through the internet, it is today, and additional elements are being added regularly. That's also the case. So, if you, I checked the, the, that uh, website yesterday, and today it's regularly updated, in fact. But this was not the case when it was decided. Okay. So, uh, there was a nice acceptance speech, uh, uh, but it, it takes a lot of time. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's it's okay. Okay. This is how they they Colombia, approve it. Palestine, China. So we have to decide about this case. We see all the countries who say it's there, and then it's approved. Therefore, I declare decision thirteen com. Ten B eighteen. Julie adopted. I'm not sure if I can speed it up. So you see me there also behind Jamaica now, as uh, I was there. Now, and I did not agree, if you can see. <laughs> to Jamaica. And then the Minister for Culture is also the owner of a record company. So she... Of all members. 
and uh, thereafter we will uh, hear at the request of Jamaica some uh, music okay and oh, just uh, after I will, the okay it, it takes too long what you will hear at the end is One Love by Bob Marley and then the whole room starts singing <laughs> and coming with the plaques etc so okay I played during the coffee break if you want if you want to see it. And it's on the one so I, and I'm puzzled. So on the one hand, I'm glad that that uh, reggae music is included, but I'm on the one hand sad by partly being responsible for that the rules were not followed. That there are a number of issues about uh, commercialization, about the number of the texts which are not always women friendly, or sometimes homophobic, etc., etc. Et so. You can ask a lot of questions about it. On the other hand, for me, it's breaking that implicit no electricity rule because reggae is definitely with electric guitars. So it also changes the role. Okay, I see um, the time is going. What happened after that? Uh, I, will, I will try to finish in, in two or three minutes. So uh, now the system is there. And basically, if a country really wants something to be inscribed, they mobilize their friend diplomats and it's inscribed. And, uh, okay, I, I can live with that. It's more difficult if you go for Article 18, where best practices are similar. And at the moment, there's, there's a reason why this register of best practices was changed. The name was changed by the Secretariat into a register of good practices. So they say we cannot call it best practice anymore because we cannot be assured the public probably don't know, but that is really a good or, or best practice. Let's debunk it a little bit and answer. So now uh, there's a, a group uh, that has been working for uh, now three years that is reviewing the criteria of the convention. And they were meeting with a lot of uh, people using the, the apparatus of UNESCO to, to reflect about the future of that listing system. If you go to UNESCO's site, you find the results of, of those meetings. Excellent ideas asking all the right questions about updating, monitoring, uh, follow-up, uh, inflation effects, etc. Changing the criteria, what can be done. Uh, but it was, these results were considered and basically in the General Assembly they changed almost nothing. Luckily, the, the, the discussion about Article 18, so the good safeguarding uh, practices, it is still continuing. So they kept it out and this will be on the agenda in the meeting in December and next year in Paris, uh, how to deal with the Article 18. So there are very few... Uh, nation states that make use of that uh, list. And that's the reason why uh, this whole, the potential of this article is being discussed at the moment. And it's part of, uh, linked to Article 19 about international cooperation. Okay, I will skip all this. So, the reflection on this broader implementation of Article 18 was discussion going on in the last few months. Uh, they came up with, so a lot of these discussion using the nameplate, they came up with a lot of interesting proposal to simplify the criteria, to do a follow-up after inscription, to try to steer a little bit where these uh, programs are going, to uh, launch and facilitate an online platform, it's a, a lot of good ideas, and personally, against better judgment, I really hope that we will be, I'm, we are, Belgium is not in the Intergovernmental Committee, but I really do hope that the Intergovernmental Committee will take this seriously, and that they will rescue this part of the, of the convention and do it more serious. But I cannot predict if the other 24 members who are behind the nameplates of the uh, intergovernmental committee if they will take it serious and if they will uh, listen to what these experts have said, have said. Okay, so let's see what happens in December and the other and that's the, the final thing, the other
thing where that uh, is hopeful for the future is the fact that uh, the UNESCO saw that the periodic reports, so the reports every country has to submit after a few years to explain what has been happening in the years. It was problematic a few years ago because more and more countries were not submitting the reports and not responding. And it was connected to a tool called an overall results framework. This is an international tool for uh, international organizations where uh, basically it's a policy plan to go for 10 or 15 years and to have short-term, medium-term and long-term uh, outcomes and to study the impact. And that's a whole series of indicators that are uh, linked to that. And this exercise, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting exercise because it translates a lot of good ideas in the convention and in the operation directives into questions that countries have to answer. And, uh, and it's organized per continent. So Europe did that exercise, exercise last year and apparently seems to work. It seems to structure the work of a lot of policymakers We've done the exercise last year, and every continent is, is doing that. And you can see the effect that they are already trying to uh, anticipate on the next uh, round in five years on how to organize policy. So mutatis, mutandis, it's, it can have a chance to work. If you are interested in uh, how this works, uh, you find on the UNESCO website the overall <laughs> results framework and a whole series of indicators. It's an extremely rich and complex case, but it is probably the element next to hopefully Article 18 that will uh, give a future to what you can do uh, with the conventions beyond just making inventories and inscribing elements on a representative list. Okay, I went very fast. Are there questions? <laughs> <laughs>